Good morning, everybody. So, uh, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I'm gonna have to say that again. I'm so sorry. Um, so, I just want to let y'all know as y'all are coming in. So, we're right at almost 200 now. Um, good morning, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I just wanted to disclaim this. Uh, Ruth actually just told me that you know she has so much valuable information for us. And she just wants all of us to stay up to date with the most current information on the virus and as it pertains to us that, you know, she has more information, um, which means that we are going to um, be utilizing a little bit more of her time. So honestly, we should be thanking her if y'all can send her a thank you in the chat, you know, no for her. Yeah, extending her time with us today. So, you know, we originally agreed on 30 minutes and now we're pushing closer to an hour or even beyond, depending on all of the questions and all the material and everything. So, you know, truly, truly thank you, Ruth, for your time. So, um, you know, yeah, go ahead and shout out to, to Ruth for us. Tell her thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Yeah, no, I appreciate this. And I really did try to um, pare it down into something we could do in a more condensed form, but this is a complicated topic and um, it doesn't do to hurry through things. So fortunately we're recording. And so if people had planned on um, being able to wrap this up in 30 or 45 minutes um, the, and you need to, to duck out, um, the rest of it will be available to you. And I'm really in t anticipating that we'll have time to take some questions as well. So yes, absolutely. That's the plan. Thank you, thank you. Yes, so yes, in the chat, we want you to stay active, stay engaged. You know, if you hear something you like, go ahead and, uh, you know, give us a shout out and let us know that you really like that information. Um, and then if you have a specific question, you know, we did start a post in the Facebook group, um, you know, for those questions, we do have those questions and those will be asked towards the end. Um, we are gonna try to save all of the questions towards the end, just in case any of those questions are gonna get answered, you know, just to, you know, keep the flow going of the actual presentation. Now, if there's, at, uh, one thing specifically, um, you know, that is just urgent, then we'll kind of jump in um, and we may, you know, jump in as, as needed. So while we're doing this, can everybody hear each of us? Ruth, do you want to go Yeah, ahead I'm see? seeing lots of yeses. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect, perfect. All right, just making sure. <laughs> Look at it go. There you yeah, go. Awesome. Yeah, that's what we want. Thank you, guys. All right, so I was just going to wait one more minute before we kind of kick this thing off just to let everybody kind of get in. Yes, thank you, everybody. So just want to let you know that for right now, um, I want to go ahead and just keep this on Zoom just so that we can keep the video and audio clear um, without having to broadcast into Facebook. And then I'm going to post the recording into Facebook instead of just broadcasting straight into Facebook. So just FYI. All right. All righty. Well, it looks like we have, we have as many mass. people. Yeah, right, right, let's right. Go. So yes, let's, let's go. Um, all righty. The cool so, people are here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Everybody that matters. <laughs> So I will actually send the recording, Karen, to uh, via email to everybody. So um, if you'd registered, then uh, I'll, I'll make sure to send this recording out. This is very, very um, important information, and I want to make sure everybody has it, and it's, it's free for everybody. All right. So it is my honor and privilege to be able to introduce the Ruth Werner, a.k.a. the Pathology Queen. She is an award-winning educator, a longtime writer, and a retired massage therapist with a passionate interest in massage therapy research and the role of body work for people who live with health challenges. Her groundbreaking textbook, A Massage Therapist's Guide to Pathology, was first published in 1998. Oh yeah, looks all too familiar. <laughs> and is now in its seventh edition, published by Books of Discovery. Ruth is a columnist for Massage and Bodywork Magazine and Massage New Zealand. All right, I love the visuals. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> she serves on several national and international volunteer committees and teaches continuing education workshops in research and pathology all over the world. When I was looking for someone to speak on this topic, Ruth's name came up 
every single time, either by recommendation or just seeing how active she was in all of the groups or articles and everything. So Ruth, without further ado, welcome to this webinar and uh, thank you so much for doing this for us. I am uh, so happy to be here and I will um, tell our attendees that <clears throat> It was a little bit inevitable that I would be developing a webinar on COVID-19. This is the trial run. So uh, um, I'm going to ask for our uh, participants to understand that, you know, if, if anyone here is a teacher, you will know that the first time you teach a thing, um, there may be some stumbles and there may be some adjustments that need to be made. And so <laughs> this is not... Uh, you know, you're, you guys are getting the raw, the raw information here, and um, I'm delighted to be able to share it with you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ruth. So, um, as I was saying yesterday in our little pre-summit get together, um, you know, there were two things that were taken away from us whenever we hit COVID: is one, our ability, our ability to physically touch and heal people, and secondly, our ability to make those emotional connections, you know, in person. So to me, part of the summit that I wanted to make it extra special was to be able to get some backstory from all of our speakers and really make a connection. So yeah, we know what they do. We know how amazing they are with their expertise, but we don't know the reason why they do what they do and why they're so driven to just, you know, really make our industry so amazing. So with that said, Ruth, if you don't mind me asking, you know, could you share what really lit your passion for switching, you know, to pathology and just really um, hitting the ground running with it? <laughs> That's an interesting question. And anyone who has, um, you know, worked with me before, because I, I often give a little bit of my origin story when I begin classes. Um, so this may be familiar territory. I went to college in um, 19 <clears throat> and graduated with um, a bachelor's degree in theater and literature and moved to Seattle where I thought I was gonna get involved in that community and that turned out not to be a great match for me. So I was kicking around for a while, not really 100% sure what I was gonna do and sort of stumbled into massage school. It was a, it was a one of those sequences of events where the, the memory of looking in the newspaper and seeing a tiny little classified ad that basically said, go to massage school, call Brian. And then I still, I won't tell you the phone number, but I still remember the phone number because it was that clear that it was, oh, well, duh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and I found myself in that setting and I found myself completely to my surprise, loving the a and P. I mean, I, you know, I spent my academic career avoiding anything to do with science and suddenly I just could not get enough. Um, it was, I was starving. I had no idea how exciting, I, how excited I would be to do things like learn the muscles or learn uh, the endocrine system. I mean, <laughs> it's not, it, it was a big shock. Um, I uh, was invited to help some students who had joined the class a little late to get caught up uh, and discovered that I am really good at taking quite complex concepts and breaking them into small pieces and conveying them or communicating them in a way that other people can then rebuild these concepts into their own versions of what that looks like for you. Um, I just, I have a knack for that. And that ended up being, in many ways, much, much more satisfying to me than actually doing massage. So I did do massage for many years. When I was about to give birth to my second child, I closed my practice and I never reopened it. And, you know, she turns uh, 29 next year. So <laughs> it's oh, been a little awesome. while since I've been in, in really active practice. I did keep my licenses current um, until about 10 years ago so that I could do pro bono work and, you know, just do a little bit of work with my, with my friends and neighbors. But it was never, that part of my career was not my favorite part. I, I am much, much more comfortable in the classroom and, um, and being a writer and being a teacher. So that's how I've gotten here. And in, um, in this moment in time, you know, I live in this tiny little remote town at the back of beyond. The Pacific Ocean is about 500 yards out my window. 
Um, and I, you know, and it's a stretch of beach that's about seven miles long. And yesterday there were maybe two dozen people on it and was like, oh my gosh, it's so crowded here. I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, my point being, I'm, I'm in this tiny little town. We have been very little affected by the pandemic. Um, I think there are two people in my local hospital right now who have the infection because we had a, an outbreak in a town near near to us uh, last week. Um, but it's nothing like what so many other people have been living with. And what we're all doing because we want, we are called into this profession because we, we are driven by being of service. Um, we all want to figure out a way to be helpful. And I hate that this is happening, but I'm so grateful that I have a thing I can do to be helpful. And so I am doing lots of it, which is to say, you know, reading about, learning about everything I can about this virus and this infection um, as it pertains to making choices about body work. And in the early stages, that was really about, you know, hygienic practices. And I was um, delighted to be part of creating the FSMTB guidelines, the Federation of State Massage Therapy Board guidelines for infection control. Um, and I, I, I even got to consult with the massage uh, organization in New Zealand on some of those same topics, and that was really great. Um, and now, you know, the focus is beginning, at least from, from my perspective, is beginning to shift a little bit about what's going to happen when, because people are beginning to get back to work, what's going to happen when we have people on our table who maybe have been through this infection, what kinds of repercussions does that mean? To, you know, does that entail? And that's not in the, I mean, the guidelines are all about infection control. They're not about client safety <laughs> outside of trying to prevent transmission of infection. Um, and so that's a whole new territory that we don't even, we, you know, we, it's, it's unknown. So that's been my point of focus lately and, and something that we'll be talking about today. Awesome. And Ruth, we love you for it, for what you're doing for our industry and everything. So um, quick announcement, everyone. If you are on our Facebook group, I just made a post where Ruth uh, gave a, a handout specifically to coincide with her PowerPoint. So I definitely recommend going there right now. There's a shareable link at the very bottom of that post and go ahead and download that. Um, yeah. So please, let's go ahead and give a great big thank you to Ruth for her time and for the handout. My so pleasure. I'd say put your hands together, but I really want to oh, see it in yeah. the chat. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, Joshua, if someone's not on Facebook, how can they uh, grab that handout? Yes, yeah, so I can I, I wonder if I can uh, put it here. Let's see. I'm going to let you work with that. Can we go ahead and, and yeah. just dig in? Because I, I, yes. I, I, yes, we got definitely. a lot to Let's talk about. Yes, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Share. And now we're gonna go big, because that's what we do, we go big. <laughs> Come on, baby. There we go. All right, how's that looking, Joshua? Does that look all right? Oh, that looks perfect for me, yes. Okay, very good. So here we go. It's a massage therapist guide to COVID-19. And also here you will see if you want to find me, um, my website is ruthwerner.com. Um, and I'm sure Joshua will be talking more about contact issues later. Um, and here's my goal for our next little while together. And so I'm just going to just settle back, everybody, because <laughs> I'm going to be yakking for a while. And Joshua and Emily, if I say something that seems confusing or um, uh, jumble up my words or whatever, please feel free to interrupt me. You are absolutely allowed to do that. So because I want things to be really clear. Um, the way that I structure information about pathology um, is in this way. We will talk about the definition of our condition. We'll talk about who it affects, that's demographics. We'll talk about its pathophysiology, that is to say, how does it affect human function? How does it change the way we, our body works? 
Um, and that is typically what causes the signs and symptoms. A huge issue with COVID-19 is its associated complications. I have chosen several with really specific um, uh, implications for massage therapy. So we'll be looking at some of those complications, typical treatment options, and where, <coughs> where massage fits. And I talk about where massage fits in the context of what are the risks that we can anticipate, what are the benefits that we might be able to offer, and how can we make appropriate accommodations so that we minimize the risks and we maximize those benefits? And then, what, you know, in a typical discussion for me, I will conclude with what the research says about this. And there is actually a thing to say about the research about massage therapy and COVID. Before we go any further, <coughs> further you will notice I have a little cough. Um, this is a chronic cough. It is part of my life. I am not sick and I have not been exposed to COVID. Um, but I, and I will try to manage it the best I can, but having a microphone in front of my mouth is often a trigger. So I just wanted to let you know that. Um, I apologize, one moment. <coughs> Thank you. The other thing I'll say is my, um, my work partner is here laying down at my feet and if a squirrel runs over the top of my roof, he will hear it and he will have opinions. So that's one reason I'm using a headset today instead of an open mic is it helps me control um, the ambient noise, which is to say the large dog barking at the squirrels. All right, here we go. Before we dig into the rest of this, I just wanna say a quick word about the art program. I love to decorate slides. Um, I get a big kick out of it. I think it makes a presentation a lot more pleasant and, and memorable if it, there are good things to uh, look at. Um, and I want to say that um, teachers have some freedom in where they grab their images from, but I am very, very careful about this. So almost all of the art that I will share with you today has been pulled from open sourced material. So anything .gov is available to us. We've already paid for it. Wikimedia, um, things that I've had commissioned or art that I already own for other reasons. There are, however, sometimes there are images that I really needed to get from a proprietary site. When I have done that, I have provided the URL. So if anyone wants to pursue that, um, uh, that information will be there. Okay. So here we go. Are you ready? Definition. COVID-19 comes from this word root, Corona virus disease of 2019. Early, early in the day, some, some uh, government pundit made some, made some joke about how this is not COVID number one. We've been here before, but that's the 19 has nothing to do with how many coronaviruses we've already seen. It just has to do with the year in which it was identified. The COVID-19 is the name of the disease. It's the name of the infection. The causative agent of the infection is this virus called SARS-CoV-2 or severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus number two. Um, SARS number one was identified several years ago in an outbreak called SARS. Um, uh, it turns out that SARS-2, SARS-CoV-2 is more dangerous, um, partly because of how it enters into the cells. And that's a level of detail that we may or may not need to get into. If you're into understanding this sort of thing, this is a single strand RNA virus in the coronavirus family. The coronavirus family is huge. There are many, many, many coronaviruses. Some of them cause um, the varieties of upper respiratory tract infections that we cause, call common cold. Uh, coronaviruses are not weird. They're not unusual. Um, this is just a particular type of coronavirus. This virus usually enters the body by way of the respiratory tract and getting into the lungs, but it can spread from there in ways that we will talk about shortly. Um, <coughs> so I got up this morning early to look up the most current demographics. This is the data that was published by the World Health Organization as of uh, 6 a.m. Pacific time today. Um, 
worldwide we are at, uh, it's actually 8.84 million diagnoses and 465,460 deaths related to COVID-19. In the United States, we're at 2.2 million diagnoses out of about 328 million people. And we're at, as of this morning, um, we will probably hit 20, 120,000 deaths by the end of today. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. I am no longer discussing whether this is worse than flu with people. Let's, we're, we're past that. Um, who is most at risk? The people most at risk for getting really sick, that is to say not only being exposed to the virus, but having, having a life-threatening or life-ending infection with the virus, mostly are these people, elders, especially people in nursing homes, prisoners or other people living in very high density populations, which also means nursing homes, uh, workers in high density settings, and this is why in the United States we're hearing about this in, in settings like meatpacking plants. Uh, the outbreak in the town near me is at a, a fish processing plant. Um, and we see that people with pre-existing illness are the most likely to be, to get the most sick. Um, and those pre-existing illnesses typically in, include cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity. Um, if a younger person, if someone who is not an elder and someone who is not, uh, doesn't fit these other demographics, gets really, really sick, the, the most common pre-existing condition that would lead to that at this point is obesity. Not lead to that, but is associated with that. Um, is obesity. So other factors. We know that people of color are more likely to be infected and they are more likely to die compared to white people. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for this, including access to healthcare and living in high density situations and the kinds of jobs people have. Um, and there may be some genetic, some genetic predisposition as well, but at this point, it's a lot of it, we, we can see this as a social economic issue. Uh, we know that men are more likely to die than women, and we are just beginning to see hints that there may be some blood type associations with the risk of really severe infection. We're seeing that people with, and, and we don't know what the correlation is, correlation is not causation, but we see a statistical correlation that people with type A blood have a higher risk of getting very sick compared to people with type O blood. Okay, um, I just wanna check in with Joshua or Emily. I just got a little thing saying your internet connection is unstable. I wanted to make sure you can still hear me. Yes, yes, we can still hear you clearly. We're good? Um, can everybody awesome. else okay. hear? Everybody's good? Okay, yes, we're getting a lot awesome. of yeses thank coming you. through. Perfect, yes, thank you. Great, good. So aren't you glad you came this morning so we can talk about toilets? Um, we know that the virus enters the body most often by way of the respiratory tract. There is actually some evidence that it may also even be able to get in by way of the conjunctiva on the eyes. <coughs> but we find that um, the virus is present and viable in fecal material. And so oral fecal transmission is possible. So this is one reason it is super important. Among, one reason among many, it is super important to do, have good hand hygiene when we're using the toilet. But the other thing that this, that this brought up um, is the importance of closing the lid on the toilet when we have something to flush. And I just, you know, those little life tricks. Um, who, who knew that it was going to be important to close the lid of your toilet so that we can avoid an aerosolizing event of COVID virus? Um, just, you know, just a little something extra to think about when you think about how you're going to manage hygiene both in your home and in your office. Um, all right, so now we're going to talk about a little more about pathophysiology, right? So we're going to track how the virus gets in and what it does once it's inside us. We know that the most efficient way 
for this virus to be communicated from one host to another is by way of airborne respiratory droplets. And those airborne respiratory droplets are spread out most efficiently when we vocalize in some big way. So talking, especially loud talking, screaming, coughing, sneezing, singing, laughing, all of these activities are things that can spread virus into the air in little respiratory droplets. The droplets can stay airborne for about three hours. The virus stays intact for about that long. Um, and if those droplets fall on two surfaces, the virus can stay intact there as well. But what we have found is that, you know, in the early days, we were really, really nervous about things like, um, you know, the keypad on the ATM you know, on the cash machine or on the, the credit card machine, we were worried about, you know, signing things with a pen that hasn't been disinfected. All of those things are still good to be careful about. And I'm not saying we can stop sanitizing our surfaces, but what I am saying is we see that the virus is a much more efficient, trans, uh, it's much more efficiently transmitted by way of airborne droplets compared to um, uh, an indirect, um, communication on a surface that that then we would call a fomite. Um, good. And I'm, you know, I'm just going to keep going until Joshua or Emily interrupts me with an important question. So that's where we are. Uh, airborne respiratory droplets are the most efficient way for these things to spread. When the virus gets in, Again, typically through the mouth or the nose, but we, we have some hints that possibly through the conjunctiva of the eyes, which is why we might want to think about um, eye protection in the context of doing massage. Um, so it gets into the mucous membranes and it typically, the most typical thing that it does is it travels to the lungs, which makes sense because we have a pathway right here into the lungs. <laughs> And now I'm talking about lungs, and that's another coughing trigger for me. So um, the way we know that that has happened for most people is they develop a fever, a dry cough as opposed to a productive cough, chest pressure, a sense of pressure on the chest. These are the most typical early symptoms. However, this one of the things that we have learned about this virus is it can do lots of different things to lots of different parts of the body and so it may look really different from one person to another and that's something that was um that really stymied us in the early days by early days i mean like you know two months ago um, of trying to understand this infection we're going to take a closer look at that broad panoply of symptoms um, in a little bit so here's the thing. This virus, SARS-CoV-2, enters the body, enters the cells by way of a receptor on a cell membrane, and that receptor is called ACE2. And you know, possibly you've heard of a class of drugs called ACE2 inhibitors. Those are blood pressure drugs, but it's they are acting on the same receptor site of the cells. Um, so there are, we have cells that have ACE2 receptors, and that is the doorway by which the virus enters the cell. And the cells that have ACE2 receptors are found in the alveoli. And so the, you, for many people, the first site of cellular invasion is in the alveoli of the lungs. And you might remember that the way viruses work is they invade their target cell through whatever the cell receptor is. And once they're inside that cell, they change its function. So instead of being a, a cell whose job is to assist the transfer of oxygen and carbon dioxide, now this cell that's been infected with a virus is a virus factory and that alveolar cell will produce virus and produce virus and produce virus and then it will produce some more virus and it will produce so much virus that literally it explodes it ruptures and all those viral particles all those little baby viruses now go out and attack nearby cells and that's how it is that a viral that a viral infection 
works. Um, and you know, that's a little nightmarish. It's a little like vampires, isn't it? Um, but we'll come back to ways that our body manages that for better or worse in a few minutes. But, it, and, and, but here's what we have found is that those ACE2 receptors are not just on the alveoli, they are also in myocardial cells in the heart. And they're in hepatic cells in the liver and they're in nephrons in the kidneys and they're in the lining of the GI tract. We even have ACE2 receptors. We have cells that have ACE2 receptors in the central nervous system. And here is the big kicker. We have cells that have ACE2 receptors lining all our blood vessels. So the, vir the, the cells that are vulnerable to, to attack are not just the alveoli. They are the capillaries that surround the alveoli. They are in the endothelium of our tiny venules and arterioles. They're even in the endothelium of our larger veins and arteries. So we began thinking that SARS-CoV-2 was an infection of the respiratory system. But a lot of people are now considering this an infection of the cardiovascular system. And that really changes how we think about its pathophysiology, how it affects our function. So through the rest of this little talk, these bullets are gonna be a repeating theme the way this virus hurts us, the way this virus causes damage is through these three things. And only one of them is directly related to the virus. So that is a direct viral attack. Those alveolar cells that were invaded by the virus and, and destroyed, that's a direct viral attack. Same for our endothelial cells. <coughs> um, same for the liver cells, same for the heart cells. The cells that are directly attacked by the virus are damaged, and that's one source of damage. However, when we have a viral infection, especially with a fast-growing, really aggressive virus, we have a normal and healthy, but pretty aggressive, immune system response. So when a cell is invaded by a virus, what it typically does, in addition to losing its function and turning into a virus factory, is it waves a kind of a chemical white flag saying, help, help, I've been invaded. And this calls white blood cells over to the neighborhood and the white blood cells say, here, I'll help you. And then they kill that cell. And then they kill all the cells next door just in case they've been invaded too. So for a typical viral infection like cold or flu, some of our symptoms are related to a viral attack on the respiratory tract, but really most of our symptoms, the fever, the coughing, the gunk that we're producing, that's related to a normal and aggressive immune system response to the virus, which also causes cellular damage. So those are two things that cause cellular damage, the viral attack and a normal immune system response. But there's more because the third thing that happens for some people, not necessarily all of them, uh, clearly not all of them because most people who, who get this infection survive, right? But for some people, in addition to having a normal immune system response, they also have this really out of whack out of proportion, outsized inflammatory response, which is sometimes, you know, has as a component this phenomenon that we call a cytokine storm. Now, I have tried to figure out, I've tried to learn what I can about cytokine storms um, while also not knowing very much about chemistry. Chemistry is not my jam. Uh, I, you know, I can, I can, slog through it and make a little bit of sense from it, but it's very hard for me to convey because that's not my, it's not my comfort zone. So what I can tell you about cytokine storms is that it has to do with an, an, an immune system that goes nuts and becomes a self-sustaining inflammatory process. So we have much more than a normal immune system response. We have a really outsized immune system response with a lot 
of collateral damage connected to that. So I hope that's going to be adequate for our uh, for where we are for right now. Um, so we have so so those I'm actually I'm going to go back for a second. So I want to revisit these three bullets. We have the cellular damage from a direct viral attack, a normal immune system response, and this outsized inflammatory response, and we have it in lots of different places. But when we start here in the lungs, we begin with alveolar collapse, right? The alveoli, the alveoli can't do their thing anymore. The cells are dying. The surfactant is destroyed. That, that's the chemical that keeps the alveoli inflated. Um, they collapse. The capillaries that surround them are now infected, and the capillaries are gunged up with, with goo, and they can't do their job. And the consequence of that now is really, really limited gaseous exchange, right? We're supposed to be exchanging uh, carbon dioxide from the blood with oxygen from the outside air in those alveoli, and that just can't happen very well. So we have loss of lung function. We have endothelial damage. We have this crazy exaggerated immune system response and the net result are all these different things. And the rest of this discussion is gonna be about how all these different things affect our function. So hypoxia is low oxygen in the blood, that's a problem. Blood clots arise for, a, for several reasons, but the main things are we have damage to the endothelium because it's being chewed up by the virus plus this outsized immune system attack and that leads to blood clotting. We have cells that are starving for oxygen, both because they may be blocked with blood clots and because of hypoxia, and that's called poor tissue perfusion. That's very painful. We have inflammation and edema because we have this immune system response and it's got nowhere to move because the capillaries aren't working very well. And when we look at this in different tissues, that's gonna lead us down different tracks for signs and symptoms and for complications. These are pictures of um, the, it's called the, the ground glass image. These are CAT scans of people's lungs that have been affected by um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, <coughs> so the good news is that most people who get this virus recover and they recover without a lot of fuss, um, which is very, very good news. Uh, we see now I, you know, prepared this presentation for um, a U.S. audience, and I know that we have attendees who are not from the U.S., so I apologize for the U.S.-centric um, version of this, but that's the perspective from, you know, that I'm qualified to speak to. Um, we see in the United States that our diagnostic rates are rising, our mortality rates are leveling off, but they are not dropping. Um, and you know, one, one of the things that that reflects is people who are less sick are being diagnosed, and that, that's important information. But we see these diagnostic rates are rising, and this can be due to you know, that we're easing some restrictions. Um, there are more public gatherings. Um, and I expect you know, be that where we are now is three or four weeks out from the lifting of restrictions that was around the end of May. Um, since then, we've had the protests and we had other sort of large scale um, gatherings. And I expect that we will probably see another significant spike in diagnoses. Um, but at this point, because we're not being great about contact tracing or, or social isolation, the metrics that are much more pertinent for us to be watching is, you know, while it's useful to know about how many people are diagnosed, because you'd like for those people to be putting themselves into quarantine, a much more relevant piece of information is, is what are the hospitalization rates like in your area and what is the mortality rate? You know, the big thing, of course, that we're most concerned about at this moment in time is overwhelming our hospital system. If our hospitals have capacity, then people who check into them are more likely to survive. When hospitals are absolutely overwhelmed and there's not enough equipment and people are triaged out in the hallways waiting for a chance at a ventilator, um, that's when our mortality rate begins to climb. 
This um, chart that I found I thought was really interesting. This is a per capita report of COVID-19 deaths per 100,000 population. So it's not, it's not a how many people within a group are infected, it's how many people per 100,000 um, have died so far, and this takes us up through the 14th of June. And we'll see here that the United States is the black dotted line. Relatively speaking, our death rates compared to um, Spain and the United Kingdom have been low that will continue to change because you know if we if you if you follow this sort of thing you will see that um that that the united kingdom and the uk are really on the downslope for new infections and the united states is very much on the upslope so if any of our listeners has been has had the nasal pharyngeal swab for covid um this picture may uh, be a little triggery. I've heard people describe it as having your brain tickled because that's how far back this swab has to reach into the nasal sinuses. Um, we have some real challenges with managing the spread of the virus and, and the challenges begin with testing challenges. First of all, you know, at least in the United States, we had a shortage of tests. It, you couldn't get tested unless you already had symptoms by that time because of the way the virus works if it has moved from the upper respiratory tract down into the lungs even people who are really sick can test negative um, the nasopharyngeal swabs report the presence of a current infection if it picks up some signs of virus in the upper respiratory tract um, but it has it has a pretty high rate, 25 to 35% of what we call false negatives. That is to say, people are told they don't have an infection when in fact they do. The swab just didn't happen to catch any cooties on it. Cootie is a technical term that's spelled C-O-O-T-I-E. Um, and then we have antibody tests to look for signs of past infection. In other words, you know, once a person has been sick for a week or so with this virus and they've begun to produce antibodies, hopefully that will show up in an antibody test. But our antibody tests, are, again, are iffy. And uh, we're still looking for one that is um, uh, both fast and accurate. And uh, we, you know, we're still struggling with that. And so because it's really hard to identify who is sick now and who has been sick in the past, it becomes really hard to contain the virus. <coughs> so now let's talk about signs and symptoms. Um, signs and symptoms of COVID typically de uh, develop somewhere between two to 10 days after exposure. The sweet spot for an accurate test is two or three days before symptoms develop and two or three days after symptoms develop. And if you test outside those at um, parameter, you're less likely to get an accurate test. And so that makes it really hard to, to monitor who's, who, who actually has been infected. So people typically develop signs and symptoms two to 12 days after exposure. The profile varies a lot. The most typical profile, as we've talked about earlier, is that dry cough, that sense of pressure on the chest, shortness of breath, and high fever alternating with, well, high fever and chills. And of course, what our body shivers in order to bump up our internal temperature and that contributes to the fever. But also, um, you know, this looks so different for different people. Not everybody has the respiratory symptoms. Some people, their earlier signs and symptoms include really severe muscle and joint pain, um, debilitating fatigue, headaches, especially headaches in a new pattern. Um, we've heard people talking about the loss of smell and the loss of a sense of taste. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about complications. Some people don't get the dry cough. They get congestion and a runny nose and a productive cough, sore throat. And if the virus goes after the GI tract, which where we saw there are ACE2 receptors, then their prominent early signs and symptoms may include GI dis dis discomfort, including nausea, 
and vomiting and diarrhea. It just looks really different in different people. And each of these signs and symptoms indicates that this virus is taking up residence and causing those three things that we've talked about, right? Viral attack, a, a, a normal immune system response, and possibly an outsized uh, inflammatory response on top of that in all of these different areas. So now we get to the sticky part, um, which is the complications. And I have chosen a list of complications. Some of these we're going to talk about in a bit of detail and others will just acknowledge that these exist and they are important for massage therapists. Um, but these, this is where the rubber hits the road for us. So right now, you guys, there are, um, what, would, what do we say, 2.4 million people in the United States who have been infected with this virus. And about 80% of those people will probably recover without a problem, but about 20% of those people will probably develop some serious repercussions, um, including these things, coagulopathy, which is a fancy way of saying blood clotting problems, heart failure, kidney damage, liver injury, muscle and joint pain, that should make you pay attention, central nervous system damage, mental and mood issues, and a whole bunch of other things that nobody's even tracking yet. So we're gonna talk about these in a little bit of detail. And the first one I wanna talk about because it's the first thing massage therapists should be aware of is the risk of coagulopathy. So let's remember that we have endothelium, you know, one of the hallmarks of a COVID infection is damage to the endothelium. And the first place that that has repercussions is in the lungs, right? Because when we damage the endothelium in the alveoli and in the capillaries, then we're gonna lose our carbon dioxide oxygen exchange in the lungs. But you guys, that's also happening out in the tissues where the CO2, O2 exchange is happening in the opposite direction. We're supposed to be dropping off oxygen and picking up carbon dioxide to carry back to the lungs. And if we're having endothelial damage in the capillaries, that can't happen out in the tissues either. And the net result is we can have damage to the endothelium and microvascular clotting and or microvascular bleeding out in the extremities. And this is the, um, at least one of the things behind the, that phenomenon that you have maybe heard about called COVID toe. What we're seeing here is the result of blood vessel damage in the extremities. Um, Petechiae is a, is a fancy word for tiny micro bleeds under the skin. And petechial rashes is, an, is another sign that people are reporting um, with a COVID infection. So one of the things we want to be sure about to ask about with our clients, and, and I'll be emphasizing this again before we're done today, is, you know, have you noticed any changes in your skin? This phenomenon can be absolutely painless or it can be quite painful. It can cause swelling, it can cause itching or tingling or stinging sensations. Sometimes there are blisters. Um, so these are uh, physical repercussions of this infection that obviously have big repercussions for massage therapy and we'll talk about how to manage that in a little while. But while we're having this microvascular clotting in the extremities and in the tissues, we can also be having macrovascular clotting in the coronary arteries and the carotid arteries and any of the other arteries that might lead to other tissues like the liver and the kidneys and the intestines. Um, and that is another big cautionary issue for massage therapists. So maybe you've seen some articles about how young people are being diagnosed with stroke who would otherwise not be at risk for stroke or young people having a heart attack who would, you know, we wouldn't have put into the demographic for someone at risk for heart attack and then it turns out that they had COVID. Um, it's not typical that coagulopathy is a is an important but silent early indicator for COVID, but it's something that definitely needs to be on our radar. So that's coagulopathy. 
Hang on one moment, I need to cough. <coughs> we are seeing that people, especially people with any history of heart disease, but it can happen for people with no history of heart disease as well, that some that that a person coming through a COVID infection can develop new heart problems. Again, we've got our three main players here, right? A viral attack on the myocardium, a regular immune system response, and an outsized inflammatory response. Plus which, now let's think about the heart having to push blood, which is low in oxygen. That means that heart's gonna work harder, pumping harder to get oxygen low blood through the body because we need to deliver as much oxygen as we can. Now let's throw in the fact that the blood is thicker than usual because of the coagulopathy and the heart is working harder and harder and harder to push thick oxygen low blood throughout the system. This is a huge load on the heart and the, and the net result can be stress cardiomyopathy, arrhythmia, and heart failure. And that, you know, some of that can be resolved when the infection is over, but some of it can lead to permanent heart damage. Um, this person's face has been covered for this, for this photograph just out of respect for the individual. This is a, uh, from an article in the New York Times. We see our similar trio. We've got the viral attack on the nephrons and an, uh, an immune system response plus extra inflammation. Plus, we have the risk of these tiny little microvascular clots, tiny um, renal infarctions, and damage to the glomeruli. Plus, those kidneys are now operating without enough oxygen. They're, they have low tissue perfusion because of the hypoxia. And so people with COVID can require temporary dialysis. And that turned out to be a big surprise. Uh, you, you might remember in the early stages of this disease, which is to say, Oh, uh, March and April, when we were scrambling to be sure we had enough ventilators to go around, a completely unanticipated complication was we didn't have enough dialysis machines to go around. Um, and now we know to anticipate that that's, that that's an issue. And while some of this kidney damage may, rec may repair, um, some people find that they are now at risk for longer term kidney damage. And again, because this is so new, um, we don't know what that's even going to look like in a year from now. So this is because kidneys are such a keystone in fluid management. I feel it's important for massage therapists to have this uh, on our list of things that can go wrong with this condition. This virus can attack the liver. Some patients show elevated enzymes in their blood work that indicate liver damage. The problem with liver damage is it often doesn't show, create big symptoms. It doesn't make people pay attention to it while the liver is sustaining damage. Um, and so we would only find this you know, in, in, in doing some blood work. Again, we're looking at this as a viral attack on the hepatocytes plus an inflammatory response. However, there's another contributor to the potential for liver damage, and that is a negative reaction to all the drugs that people need to take to manage this infection. So this is called drug-induced liver injury or DILI. Um, most of the cases so far of people who have sustained liver damage, they mostly clear without even being treated, but it's something that the doctors want to watch pretty carefully. However, some people, some uh, survivors are, are on long-term liver support uh, drug regimens. Um, and that, again, you know, who knows what that's going to look like in six months. Probably, livers are good at growing back. They will probably recover okay, but it's something we want to watch for, again, because livers are a keystone for fluid management and any kind of work we do that impacts how someone's fluid flows is, you know, we want to make sure that all of their systems are in good shape. Um, when I interviewed some people who have been through this infection, and when I and I will share with you another resource for um, uh, uh, learning about what it what it's like to live with this, um, I was appalled and frightened to hear that muscle and joint pain is a big is really really common 
complication related to this infection. We saw it in our list of symptoms, but it's also something that can be a long-term repercussion. And what I wanna emphasize about this muscle and joint pain is that it is severe, it is deep, it is unlike what people have experienced in the past, and it is not related to any specific physical activity. So it's not like this guy was out, you know, uh, trying to remove a tree stump yesterday. Um, and that's why <laughs> his, his neck and upper back are so painful he can barely move. Um, this is something that people that develops, it seems, spontaneously. Uh, it may develop along with a fever, which is, a, a, you know, a safety net for us because fever is a good reason to delay treatment. But we want to just be really, really clear. If our client who is a COVID survivor comes to us telling us about this incredible level of back pain that they have never had before, and it's unlike anything they've ever experienced, and they just can't wait to get on your massage table, we want to have as clear an idea as possible about what's contributing to that. And, and it can be really hard to get a clear picture. So among the things that might contribute to this um, is that a lot of people post-COVID develop a, a pretty sudden onset of signs that meet every criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. Um, and these are conditions that indicate massage. However, we also want to be able to rule out things that might not indicate massage. So, you know, another thing that can cause this deep muscle pain is hypoxia, right? Poor perfusion of oxygen into the muscles and the joints. Um, that might be okay for massage if we're really careful about it and if there's not a lot of capillary damage. But we want to know about, you know, we can't know about capillary damage and the risk of maybe tiny little microemboli. Um, I'm going to come back to this, so don't panic, because I am going to speak to this when we come to the massage part. Um, but the last thing I want to say about muscle and joint pain related to COVID is that a rare but not unheard of complication to this kind of viral infection is a condition called rhabdomyolysis. And what happens in rhabdomyolysis um, is that there, there is a muscle, typically this is localized, There's, there, it's focal pain like in a calf or in a shoulder. Um, there's, there's a muscle, a muscle has been severely damaged. And as the, as the myofibers break down, they release garbage into the bloodstream that is terrible for the kidneys. So rhabdo begins with muscle damage and it finishes with renal failure. Um, and so if someone is reporting really extreme focal muscle pain and also that their urine is a really funny color that they've never seen before, this is a really good reason to make sure that their next stop is the emergency room, okay? Um, so that's rhabdomyolysis, which is another possible factor in the muscle and joint pain that we see as a pretty common uh, long-term complication related to COVID-19. I hope you're feeling a little nervous right now. You know what, I'm gonna jump ahead and tell you about some conversations that I've had. So I, um, you know, was, was in reading about this and about the coagulopathy issues, I called on some medical professionals. I don't have that many medical professionals in my circle, but I, <laughs> I, I bugged all the people that I could. And, um, a physical therapist who specializes in chronic pain syndromes and is very familiar with COVID. We, we talked about the muscle pain related to this and um, their response was no movement is worse than a little bit of movement, right? We want, even if there's deep muscle pain, any kind of movement that a person can have is only going to contribute to repair and recovery. And so gentle massage, even in the context of the hypoxia and the poor perfusion, or maybe even if there's tiny little microemboli, if we're not doing deep enough work to disrupt those deep polaries, but we are adding some sensation that reduces pain, we're probably going to be okay. Um, and I'll say more about that later, but breathe deep and look for pain that is, that is regional because focal pain, that localized, really extreme pain is more likely to be really serious. 
All right, let's talk about central nervous system damage. This one's a little complicated. Somehow, in some people, the virus appears to get into the central nervous system. Um, in one study, and one study is not enough on which to base policy or um, widespread treatment options, but in one study, we saw hints that the virus may have accessed the central nervous system by way of the olfactory nerve. So it gets into the uh, nasal sinuses and may be able to invade the ACE2 receptors on the olfactory nerve and travel into the brain that way through via axonal transport. We do know that in some patients we have seen viral particles in the cerebrospinal fluid and that's an important finding. When we see those things that we've talked about, the normal, the viral attack on the tissues plus a normal immune system response plus excessive inflammation, and that's happening inside the central nervous system, we have a big problem because of the risk for cerebral hypertension. This is a type of encephalitis, right? Too much fluid in a closed space where the tissue, nerve tissue, is really, really delicate easy to injure and it doesn't heal very quickly or very well. When we have cerebral hyper hypertension that is particularly where that might affect the brainstem, um, we may have a depressed respiratory drive. Add, you know, throw that in combination with the lung damage and we have a real problem with breathing. But we have all these other things that can happen when we have inflammation and um, nerve damage in the central nervous system. We have dizziness, vo nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, seizures, agitation, memory loss, poor concentration. All of these things can be repercussions of viral damage in the central nervous system. And some of these can last long after the virus has been, has been suppressed. We have, this is um, a sign of something that does not happen with COVID. This is a little boy responding to a stinky sock. Um, but I was looking for an image to convey something about the loss of a sense of smell. So we know that an early sign or symptom of, um, an, early, an early symptom of COVID is the loss of taste and the loss of smell. This also indicates sensory nerve damage or sensory nerve interference. In addition, some people experience periods of numbness in various parts of their body and paresthesia, which is zingy pain, tingling, alternating numbness and zappiness. Um, all of those things indicate sensory neuron involvement in this infection. And of course, the other CNS damage, the other central nervous system damage that we might see with a COVID infection is from the risk of stroke. Um, yeah, okay. Let's talk about mental and mood disorders. Um, it is not surprising that anxiety and depression are really, really common among people who have been through COVID. This is, these people are sailing uncharted waters. They have no idea what's in store for them. Their, uh, their healthcare team has no idea what's in store for them and only vague ideas about the best ways to help them. So think about someone who has an infection that is a new thing we don't know great ways to treat it. We're in complete isolation. Nobody is allowed to touch us. We have a deep fear of the illness and a deep fear of making other people sick. Now throw in that it's really hard to catch your breath. And as we know, trouble breathing is a big issue in anxiety disorders, right? That can really start that vicious circle of panic and the sense that, of not being safe. In addition to anxiety and depression, um, there is a condition that I had not heard of or had not, had not learned about before I was started learning about COVID, and that's a condition called post-intensive care syndrome. So this is something that happens for people who have been in the ICU, sometimes on ventilators, sometimes not. But what we have here is a combination of, of completely unfamiliar surroundings, heavy sedation, and the leftovers that lat leaves in the system, which can lead to horrific nightmares, paranoia, where we're, we are not necessarily convinced that the people who are there helping us are actually there to help us. Um, 
And these symptoms, these mental and emotional symptoms can persist, the nightmares and the paranoia and the leftovers of the sedation can last for weeks or months. This is essentially a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, we can anticipate seeing that, particularly in our clients who have been through really severe infections. Um, and then there's a list of things that nobody's even talking about, right? There, uh, a lot of people experience relapses. Their symptoms seem like they've cleared and then they are back in bed with a fever and terrible fatigue. Uh, pulmonary embolism we've talked about, debilitating fatigue, shingles. Lots of people who recover from COVID end up with a bout of shingles, which is just a reflection of a really, really impaired immune system. For whatever reason, some people report having bouts with this condition called benign positional paroxysmal vertigo that they never had before. Um, it's, it's a type of vertigo. It's, it, th there are treatments for it, but if you don't know what it is, it can be terrifying. Uh, people who survived COVID may have flare-ups of their autoimmune diseases, including vasculitis, and that, you know, sends us down that whole trip of damaged endothelium. People are experiencing difficulty with managing their blood glucose. They may have a bout with Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a demyelination problem in the peripheral nervous system, and a ton of other stuff. And, and where I get this is not from the medical literature. It's from hanging around on this Facebook page called Survivor Core. So, and so I've given you the website, the Facebook um, site here. Survivor Core is a fascinating place. It was begun, it was founded by a woman um, from the East Coast who had a very early bout with this, was one of the first people to recover. And in her process decided that what she needed to do for her own recovery was to create a community for people to share their experiences. And this now has well over 50,000 members that you do not have to be a survivor in order to be a member of the group. Um, and I go there to see what people are having to live with because it's a completely different story than we get from looking at what the articles say and what the medical literature says. I am so grateful to the people at Survivor Corps who share their experiences. And uh, if you are interested in working with this population, I recommend that you check them out as well. So we're almost done. <laughs> um, I do want to uh, talk just a little bit about treatment. We, um, we don't have a great treatment option, a gr group of treatment options yet. Some, you know, and it, there's, it varies a lot by individual, which is as it should be. Uh, but we don't have an antiviral that is particularly successful for this virus at this point. We do a variety of supportive drug therapies, noting that a lot of the damage is related to an, an, uh, a, a outsized inflammatory response. Some doctors um, have responded by putting, by trying inflammation suppressors, um, but that allows the virus to become much more active. And so it's all a balance. Um, we find that putting people on their bellies, which is, this is called proning patients, um, seems to be helpful. And so for, um, you know, if you happen to have a set of body cushions that you're not using, um, that allows people to be comfortably on their belly and you live in a place where your hospitals have a lot of COVID patients, you might call to see if they would be interested, if you're willing, um, to lend them your body support cushions um, while this is still an issue. If the lungs are so damaged and the body is under so much distress that the lungs just really need some time off to repair, then people can use a ventilator, but the, it has a really poor survival rate. If someone is that sick, um, they are, uh, the chances of them coming through are much less than someone who doesn't need a ventilator. And, and I don't know very much about this treatment <coughs> option yet. I haven't looked at it in detail yet. Um, we are finding that the use of convalescent antibodies, both for research purposes and the hopes of developing a vaccine, but also to boost the antibody activity, normal immune response activity to people who are sick, um, is having some success. And this is why people who have survived COVID who have high antibody levels are really, really encouraged to donate. 
So I want to emphasize that um, people who are hospitalized have a hard road to hoe. They have a, a, you know, they have some challenges in front of them, but that is also true for people who were not hospitalized. Just because you, a person is not sick enough to be checked into a hospital does not mean that they're gonna sail through this with no repercussions. So we wanna really understand that it, it is still possible to have a really severe infection and not have been hop hospitalized. It can be severe with lots of repercussions because our healthcare is really directed at helping those most extreme cases right now, people who are very sick but not sick enough to meet that bar are having a hard time getting appropriate care. It's fascinating to me that one of the things that shows up in multiple places in the literature about how people recover from life-threatening events like this over and over again is the ability to participate in altruistic acts. Um, and in the COVID community, this means donating plasma, which is what this gentleman here is demonstrating. Um, you know, the lady who started the Survivor Corps Facebook page was involved in creating an altruistic act. It's really just a, a, a point of getting outside ourselves so that th this allows us to feel we have some power and some agency in our life. And it turns out to be a really, really important part of the healing process. And um, I love that. I love that. All right, so what does all this mean for us? I, you've been drinking from a fire hose and I appreciate how hard this is. Um, and, I, and I really truly appreciate your time. Um, how do we use this information? Well, when we think about risks, because we do this in the context of risks, benefits, and accommodations. When we think about risks, we wanna be really sure about our hygienic precautions to prevent the risk of transmission. Um, and this means because of proximity and airborne droplets that um, facial massage is probably not gonna be on our menu. Um, we wanna be really careful about the risk of blood clotting and the risk of embolism. If our clients are using anticoagulants, this is a sign that their doctor has uh, determined that they are at risk for a blood clotting episode. So that's a good reason either to delay massage or to do any a type of massage that is not going to challenge their endothelial function. And that basically means super dental. That is the hardest kind of massage there is to give, um, but can be the most important for someone who's been really sick with this illness. Another thing that I think it's more important than ever to build into the way we strategize our sessions is to put every, every choice we make in the context of how does this fit within the allostatic capacity, that is to say the, the, the ability a person has to come back to homeostasis, to come back to um, uh, equilibrium. Uh, and we determine that by getting a really clear idea of what their activities of daily living are. So, you know, if your client tells you they are mostly sedentary, they're napping for four or five hours a day, they can get up and take a shower, they can get up and go to the bathroom, but beyond that, they really can't get around much. This tells us a lot about their activities of daily living and what kind of capacity they have to adapt to challenges in their homeostasis. If your client tells you that they're walking a couple of miles a day, that gives us an entirely different picture, but we want more because if that walking takes them an hour and it's on a flat road, that's different than if it's that, walk, that two miles takes half an hour and they're climbing a hill, right? So we want to have as clear an idea as possible about their activities of daily living. We want to watch out for petechiae and the risk of bruising. <coughs> And then we want to ask about other complications or repercussions of their infection that may change our, uh, change our strategies as well. If we think about benefits for people who have had COVID, um, we can offer wonderful support for someone who has been touch deprived during a very, very challenging time. We want to remember that movement, even really gentle movement, is better than no movement. And we want to be really, you know, we want to be careful about that muscle pain. If, if people are reporting deep, achy muscle pain, this is not the time to pull out the elbows and say, okay, I got, I got, the, I got, the, I, I, I got your back, right? This is a time where we really want to pull back 
and le and and use our skills <coughs> about soothing and relaxation more than about digging out adhesions. That's not our purpose here. So really we are looking at palliative massage, which is for these people is the most therapeutic massage we can offer. <coughs> so, to, you know, we've been through this, but these are the accommodations we need to make. We need to ask about any signs of cardiopulmonary distress, chest pain, shortness of breath, edema, cramping. We need to check for skin signs. We need to work conservatively with in only incremental increases in intensity. We cannot go back immediately to our pre-COVID levels of intensity. And I really want to recommend, especially for our clients who are reporting, you know, uh, experiences with the, the post-intensive care syndrome or anxiety, focusing on their breathing can be an amazing gift and convey a great sense of power and ability to cope. And I think especially in the, in the near future, it's going to be more than usually important to give people a call the following day to see how things went, to see how they slept to see if they had any unexpected responses to the massage that you offered. Um, there's no research about massage and COVID at this moment. I did see um, an article saying we've got a study in, you know, that we're, we're in the planning stages to look at, um, uh, uh, what's the word I want? Complementary and integrative care for COVID patients. Um, but this might be a time if you have the opportunity to work with a COVID survivor to think about writing a case report. And I've given you a link here to the case report hub that's at the Massage Therapy Foundation. And it's everything you ever wanted to know about how to write a case report. We're going to really need for people to share what they're doing with us. And that's that. Thank you so much. I know we went way over, but as you can tell, this is an incredibly complicated condition with a lot of important things to share. Um, and so I really appreciate your willingness to sit through this and, um, and take the steps that it takes to be, to give the best possible care for your clients and your patients. Um, I'm working all the time to produce information that I think is valuable and useful. And one thing that I, I really should have put in a link to is I did post a blog post uh, through ABMP and you can get it without um, a, an ABMP membership, but it's on, um, it's, a, it's screening questions for post-COVID po, post patients. Um, and so uh, Joshua, maybe I'll, I'll work on getting a link up on the Facebook page if you remind me about that. So I'm going to stop sharing and ask, we have some time left. Uh, and so I will invite um, Joshua or Emily to share the most important questions. And I'm seeing all the uh, thank yous and you're very welcome. Um, and I saw one question I want to talk about, which is what are my thoughts on masking? And then I'll, and then I'll let you guys uh, uh, take okay. it from there. Um, I am in favor of masking. There's a lot of data. Um, the most reliable data is in favor of masking. Uh, if you have access to the uh, paper masks, those are probably, and you know, that you would have to change with every client. Um, those are probably more effective than cloth masks. Cloth masks are more effective than no masks. Um, I think clients also should be masked, particularly when they're face up or on their sides. And when they are face down, I am less um, fussed about that. Heal Well had a really nice video on how to make a little sort of respiratory droplet catcher with a pillowcase for when your client is face down on the table. Um, but the data says if both parties are masked, um, the risk of transmission is cut by 90 to 95%. And because we are in a small, you know, often a small room without great air quality, um, masking becomes even more important. Um, but I think that dealing with air quality is another really important thing we have to do. And I am not an expert on HEPA filters. Uh, and so don't ask me about those because I don't know. 
All right, so uh, Joshua or Emily, anything else that you'd like to, to talk about in our next, let's call it 10 more minutes? Yes, definitely. No, that sounds great. So thank you so much for all of your amazing information. So I'm sorry it went so long. <laughs> No, no, honestly, you know, what we're seeing from everybody, they're saying it was worth every second. So yeah, you know, if y'all just say, you know, thank you uh, to Ruth. And then as we get into all of the questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Emily and she's going to go ahead and get through those questions for y'all. Okay. Emily, you're muted. Emily is still muted. Everybody's muted but me. I'm just going to keep yakking. <laughs> um, yeah, I will also say thank you to Joshua and Emily for creating this event. Um, I expect to have to create a more polished version of this um, as I learn, you know, what are the places that need um, special attention. I'm going to be presenting something like this a, a couple of times over the next few weeks. So, Emily, looks like you're up. Yes. Hello. Thank you, Josh, for unmuting me. Um, so I wanted to start with a question from Leslie on the Facebook page. She uh -huh. said, as a general rule, how often do you feel that us as massage therapists and full-time practice should be tested if we are not showing symptoms and following the suggested protocols, assuming the testing is available and free? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a big, that's a, an important assumption. Um, and I would say, like I say, to virtually every question, it depends. Um, and one of the things it depends on is what are the diagnostic rates in your area? So for instance, in my area, you know, up until three weeks ago, there were four cases in my county mm -hmm. and I would not consider frequent testing to be a high priority. However, as of this week, there are like 300 cases in my county. And so, you know, that's a change. Um, and so I would say it depends on what's happening for your local diagnostic rates. If your testing is free and accessible, it's not a, it's, it's not a fun fest. I mean, I know that there are nasal swabs that don't have to go as far back, but again, we're, we are in, uh, we're already having such a hard time getting an accurate test. Um, uh, with the nasal swabs, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm in favor of the idea that more information is better than less information. And so I would say absolutely as frequently as you like. Um, and, you know, if you're seeing, you know, more than five or 10 clients a week, I would think weekly for sure. But that's the best I've got for you. Great. Thank you, Ruth. And then we also have another question here on Zoom. We have someone asking, when do you think it will be safe for the people who are at high risk to give or receive massage? Mm -hmm. Again, it depends yeah. on what's happening in your area. Um, you know, when I wrote those, when I wrote the, or it didn't, I didn't write them by myself. When I worked on the FSMTB guidelines with my partner and we, our focus was on massage in hospital settings and in outpatient clinics. So it, med, a medical sort of setting. Um, what we wanted to suggest is the safest time to go back to work is when local hospitalization rates and mortality rates have been following, falling for two weeks. Um, and then to be prepared to close down again, A, if someone associated with your practice turns up positive, and B, if, you know, your local rates are beginning to climb again. Um, but that doesn't really, you know, what that leaves out is what if the therapist is high risk? What if the patient is high risk? What if someone in the therapist's family is high risk? So if, you know, if you, Emily, are a young, healthy person, then you're not particularly at high risk, but you are living with um, your grandmother who is, you know, at what point is it safe for you to get back, back to work? And there are, there's a lot of things we can do to minimize that risk of, of dealing with associated people. And one of, one of the really important ones is to change clothes, right? And to mm -hmm. shower and to, you know, try to create some really strong walls between our work setting and our home setting. But for people who are high risk in the office, that's a harder call for me. Um, okay. 
So I can't give you a when. Um, you know, one of the things it depends on, what are the things it depends on? It depends on local infection rates and local mm -hmm. hospitalization rates. It depends on how strong your, let's say it's the client who's at high risk. It depends on how strong they are. You know, so if, so if it's someone safe who has diabetes, but they keep it under really good control and they exercise and their blood sugar is steady and, you know, they are, their diabetes is, an, is, a, is a part of their life, but it is not interfering in their health. That's a really different picture from someone who um, has MS and because of all of the stress, they're in MS flare. I have a friend who has lupus and, you know, he, there was a while he couldn't get his hydroxychlor, he couldn't get his lupus drug because it was being sequestered for people with COVID. I mean, that, you know, those kinds of high risk people are really, really a different picture. So I wish I could give you a solid answer. There isn't one. It's really what I, what I would ask you to do is make a list of all the risks and then ask yourself if you can satisfactorily manage the risk. So if the risk is my person's really, really stressed and this has knocked a hole in their immune system, that's a little different from my person is managing their risk factor pretty well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you can answer it the best you can, but like yeah, said, I would be lying if I said there was some kind of, you know, formula. There's not. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I have Linda on the Facebook group asking us if someone had a confirmed COVID-19 case mm -hmm. and recovered, is there a shedding period of time post disease? Um, is it a few days, a few weeks, and then the symptoms following that um, and the contraindications? I know you kind of covered some of those, um, but what does that shedding period look like after someone recovered? If only we knew. Yeah. <laughs> right? If only we knew. I mean, typically what we can look at, and, and the first question on my post-COVID screening um, suggestions is, what does your doctor say about your communicability? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, my understanding is a person is considered that they are done with their infection and no longer communicable when they get a minimum of two or three negative nasal swabs. Okay, when they'd had positive ones before. Um, and what I can tell you on behalf of my son, so my son has had COVID, we think. Um, he's a paramedic and he's, so he's a first responder mm -hmm. and he was sick for two or three weeks and I, and I didn't get to see him and it would kill me. Um, but he never tested positive. And mm -hmm. when after his respiratory tract infection passed and he had two negative tests, they put him back to work. So we have to say, to the best of our knowledge, when someone has a minimum of two or three negative tests after an infection, we, we are pretty confident they are no longer shedding the virus. Right. That, you know, but again, <laughs> that might not be true. <laughs> We don't really know, but with so far that is holding to be a, you know, a reasonably reliable answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I also have quite a few people here on Zoom asking how you feel, what your suggest suggestions are about using sheets, you doing hands-on skin-to-skin contact, if we should be performing massage for the clothes, and then also some of these people using hot stones or silicone cups, if that's sanitary. Right. Well, I'll do that one first. Hot stones and silicone cups can be disinfected. Mm -hmm. So that's in virtually, <laughs> pardon me, virtually all of the guidelines, right, is, is and, and hot stones in particular can be, you know, they can even be sterilized. Um, I, I don't know that that the silicone cups would stand up to those to that very well, but mm -hmm. they can. You can use hospital grade disinfectants on all of your tools. Right. Um, what we said in the guidelines, and again, the guidelines were written when we thought that surface to surface, you know, that fomite transmission was really potent, and it turns out probably to be less potent. Doesn't mean you can't. You don't have to pay attention to it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but what we said in the guidelines is sheets are adequate and you can wash them in regular hot water and soap. The virus is not that sturdy. It will dissolve with soap. Okay. Um, we recommend, we don't, we don't necessarily recommend doing massage gloved. That does not seem to be necessary unless you have, you know, open lesions on your hands, but that is not a mode of transmission. We glove when we have, you know, open lesions on our hands because of other problems, right? Um, but we do recommend wearing gloves for the cleaning part because while you're picking up your sheets and swabbing your surfaces, you don't want to be doing this, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So that's our, that's, that's a recommendation that I stand behind. And later this week, you're going to be talking to Ann Williams, right? And I assume that she's going to be talking about hygienic practices. So that's a good question for Ann okay, as great. well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, um, it's, it's funny because someone asked me the other day, yesterday about, you know, am I back doing massage? A, I don't do massage, but I actually did one the other day, I have a neighbor, and we've, we've sort of been bubbling together, so we, you know, we, it, it, it's, it's, we spend time together, but we're not in close proximity, but she was having terrible pain, and she's an older lady, and I stood behind her, we were outside, I stood behind her, and she sat backwards in a chair, and I rubbed her shoulders, and it's the first, you know, through her clothes, it's the first person I've touched, except for my husband, since early March. And it was amazing how we were, we were both almost in tears. It was really mm -hmm. incredible. And I, you know, I think that careful massage in settings where there's good air turnover and you're not face to face um, and, and then you wash your hands. Um, I think this is within our capacity. Mm -hmm. I really, I really, I really do. If we're just, you know, we have to be so careful. I think the idea of, of seeing seven and eight people in a day is a no, is a non-starter. Um, right. But uh, other than that, and that's, again, that's really more for your conversation with Anne. All right, great. All right, how much time do you have left to answer questions? Because we have plenty, but I don't want to go overboard with that. Yeah, um, let's just do, let's do two more questions, and then I need to get ready for my next, for my next meeting. I'm sorry. Absolutely. So I have quite a few people um, speaking about being enclosed in a small room that's yeah. unventilated ventilated and they are wondering, do you suggest having air purifiers in the room? I do. I do suggest it. It's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, again, not an expert on this. And that's something, you know, that, that may be a, a good question for Anne. The other thing I would suggest, if, particularly if you're in a room without a window, if you're in a room with a window, open it between clients. Mm -hmm. Right. Even if it's nasty outside, still open your window between clients and maybe add a fan to just get some turnover with inside and outside air. Um, if you're in a room with no windows, you should have had an air purifier already. I mean, it's just they, they get so stuffy. Yeah. Um, um, how, you know, is it going to keep you completely safe? No. Will it add to your capacity to manage transmission? Probably yes. Okay. And again, right. Anne will have more to say about that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are asking, what is the weight against the length of exposure compared to doing just a 30-minute session to 60 and 90 okay. minutes? What we learn is that the two, what, it, what appears to be true at this moment in time, <laughs> do you see how I cover myself very carefully yes. there? <laughs> What appears to be true at this moment in time is that the two biggest factors in transmission risk are time and proximity, okay. right? So how long you're in an enclosed space together and how close together you are, which is why we look for the six foot distance and why we look for short periods of time. When I worked on the CDC guidelines, the CDC defined extended period of time as 30 minutes or more. Um, which may be why, at least I know in Illinois, aren't you in Illinois? Yes, I am. Um, their back to practice rule said your massage has to be 30 minutes or less. Mm -hmm. That makes people a little crazy because are you really at lower risk of transmission if you're seeing, you know, eight 30-minute <laughs> appointments a day or four 
60 minute appointments a day, mm -hmm. right? Is that really a lower risk? And I, you know, I, that's stats and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, I, it, my own opinion is if you're in a room with really great air quality or if somehow, God love you, you have the ability to practice outside in a, in a private area, um, then, then longer than 30 minutes probably is not a big problem. But if you're in an enclosed room, you might want to think about shortening your appointments for a little while. Mm -hmm. It's a thought. I, again, we're making this up as we go along. We're just trying to figure out the best things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just want to say thank you, Ruth. We appreciate you spending this time with us, answering some of these questions many of us have had. And um, yeah, we're just so thankful to be able to get some of the insight, the pathology behind this to have a better understanding of what this disease is. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks to everybody for, for popping in today. I'm really honored that you would spend this time with me. And I'm really so proud of our, our profession. You know, not everybody agrees with me on all the stuff, right? And, and, there, and I've lost some friends over this. That's okay. <laughs> but it's because we're really passionate about bringing our best. And, um, and I love that our profession is, is, is trying to do that. So thanks, everybody. And I will see you when I see you. Stay well, stay healthy, wash your hands. Yes. Um, and I will put a link to those COVID screening questions up on the Facebook page. And, and Josh, I will, Joshua, I will also email it to you so you can get it to the people who okay. um, are not on Facebook. Yes, well, that sounds great. Well, I really appreciate everything that you've shared with us, especially the emotional connection that you were talking about when you did that massage. You know, that's something that we all yeah. long for and, you know, for you to be able to do it and tell us that there's hope. I think it is absolutely amazing. So thank you so much again. And we really appreciate everything that you do for us. My pleasure. I'm honored to have a chance to be helpful. Thanks. That's my altruistic action. So yeah. <laughs> thanks, you guys. Thanks for setting this up. Um, more power to you. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye, Ruth. Okay. So for everybody else who's still on, um, we are actually planning on doing another little mini after session get together and we're going to do this after every single session and it's just for us to be able to kind of network and uh, bring therapists together and build community so um and then also if y'all could i would like to actually get a couple of y'all and make like a video for ruth just to tell her thank you so much for you know um, taking the time to make this presentation for us. So I'm actually going to ask her specifically if we can get access to the slides just because I know that she's using them for some other presentations. So I'm not exactly sure on that. I know that some of y'all asked that specifically. So yes, this information is absolutely crucial. So I'm going to make sure to ask her that. Now for those of you that didn't get those questions answered, I'm also going to give her a list of all those questions and see if she can answer those and I will post those in the group. So it's really important that you stay connected in the group. I'm sorry, it was a little rocky start. We did have some people drop off and uh, or not be able to make it in here. So I'm definitely going to post the recording. So thank you, everybody who stuck with us. What I'm going to do, uh, we're going to just take a little break. You know, I know we've been sitting here a little longer than we were supposed to, but I mean, honestly, the information is absolutely wonderful. Um, so it is 1140 right now. So let's say in the next 20 minutes, let's go ahead and... Uh, uh, take some time, uh, go outside, get some sunlight, walk around, um, use the restroom if you need to, and then we'll be back in, let's say, right at noon for me, that's central. Um, that's one o'clock for Eastern, um, 11 Mountain, and uh, 10 o'clock uh, Pacific. So if y'all want to join us for that, we're actually going to go ahead and uh, just jump back on to here, um, and then we can actually pull um, attendees and uh, have y'all actually come up and introduce yourselves and just, you know, just share some time for networking. So I really appreciate all of your support. So I can see y'all in the chat box. Thank you so much. This really truly means a lot to me and to Emily, of course, um, you know, just y'all being able to, to support us and come together because, you know, we've all been, you know, really longing for the emotional connections, you know, and, uh, you know, so thank you. I really appreciate it. I will see y'all back in about 20 minutes. Okay. All right. Bye.